Good morning, everybody. It is so wonderful to see you. We want to welcome those who are joining us online and our Greece campus with us. Um, it is Christmas. Um, can't believe we go from putting that tree in the attic to why are we pulling that thing out again? Time has gone so quickly. And I'm so glad that you are here and we're going to have a, a wonderful time together. Um, while I get everything ready, would you do me a favor and just fist pump the people around you and say, so glad that you are with us right here in this moment. Um, I'm so glad that um, we are here. I'm going to pray for us, and then, then we're going we're gonna to start our conversation. And if you guys can help me with the lights to make the, the house a little bit more intimate um, in our conversation here today. Come on, let's close our eyes. Greece Campus, those who are joining us online, Father, we are deeply thankful for your beautiful grace. Um, God, the bigger miracle really in this season is that you will help us slow down, walk slower, breathe deeper, uh, that there will be an anticipation in our heart that we will not just... Uh, be washed in the current of our culture, but in this season, this Advent season, may we experience a new breaking in of God on our own lives. And I pray here today that uh, you would give us eyes that can see and ears that can hear, hearts of deep understanding. And God, I pray this every week. Thank you that you love us. Um, in our seeking and our finding and our drifting in our mountains and in our valleys and our making peace and in our rebellion, you love us. And I thank you that you gather us in and you breathe hope over all of us here today at our campuses and those who are hearing my voice online, oh God. Thank you that we are not here by accident, but today may we hear the appointed voice of God's Spirit speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So C Christmas is an interesting time, and, and I thought just to bring some introduction to the season, I went online, and like all good theologians, I went to Google to go just see what kind of crazy traditions you will find in the world. And, and I found a whole bunch of really crazy ones. I want to share with you one in Sweden. Um, I cannot even pronounce this. It's a yuvla. The, the yuvla goat in Sweden is the 13-meter goat that in yuvla, uh, um, a castle center square, they erect this since 1966. For 52 years, they've been erecting this goat during the Advent season. Now, what is crazy, another tradition has spun off them building this goat is that there's people that try to sneak by security and burn the goat down. And they've been successful 29 times. <laughs> Isn't that just so funny? And Japan is not big for Christmas, strange enough. But a tradition has found its way into Japan that Christmas is not Christmas unless you have Kentucky fried stinking chicken on Christmas. Isn't that funny? Now, um, Iceland is interesting because they have... 13, they call them the Yule Lads, troll-like people, 13 of them, and 13 days before Christmas, they would visit all the cities and be playful, and the kids would put out their best shoes at night, and if you're a good kid, you get a present. If you're a bad kid, the trolls put a rotten potato in your shoe. Now, in our culture, you do that with your kid, you're going to pay a lot of money for therapy for a very long time. There is one more, and that is in Norway that I found quite intriguing. Norway is all about hiding the broom. Because in Norway, many centuries ago, they believed culturally that during the Christmas season, that witches and evil spirits come out during Christmas, and that they need brooms to ride on to travel. 
So if you leave your broom out, the witches are going to take your broom. So in order not for your broom to be stolen, to this very day, people hide their brooms as part of their Christmas tradition. Now, I don't know why you're laughing. Let's talk about us. <laughs> because I think if someone was preaching in Sweden, they would go like, let me tell you about America. Because let me, let me just get in your business a little bit and in mine. I've already seen some of you um, have gone to Stokey Farm because no, God forbid, Pete's didn't cut the perfect tree. You have got to go. And if you've got an opinionated wife, it's a four-day journey. You walk around the tree and you go like, I'm not just, I just, I'm just don't feel it, honey. I don't feel it. I don't know what you want to feel, but it takes an awful long time. You've got to crawl under that thing and saw it. And when you crawl under there and you see sore marks of other people, you know they had an opinionated wife that changed their mind halfway through the soul marks. But some of you, you are over Stokey Farms. You go down to Pete and you go get one of those pre-cut trees. And some of you have lived longer than that. You go into the attic and you get that artificial fake tree. You shake that thing down. You put some insecticide on it. Get the bugs out. And now you, you've time to decorate that thing. And decoration is a job. And I don't know if you have the same evil spell on your Christmas lights that we have in ours. There are always nine or ten that are just dead every year. And you want to shake it until it either works or replace it. That's usually how it goes. And then comes buying the presents. And you've got to sit down with your wife and go like, honey, let's not use the credit card. Because they're already on us. And we're not going to do a lot. We're going to go easy. We're going to go to five below, baby. We're going to go dollar store. The kids won't know the difference. And, and, and then you've got to buy the gifts and hide the gifts. And some of you during Christmas season are so thankful that your family is only two siblings and no children. For some of you, you've got half a nation that you've got to buy for. And, and the pressure. You don't even like the people you are buying it for. And then you've got to hide the presents because if you've got kids, you know they are like mm, termites and rats. They get into the presents if they can find it. And you hide it and you've got to bring it down Christmas morning because that's the magical. And for some of you, it's Christmas Eve. And then the tension is about Santa and baby Jesus. And you've got to make sense why there isn't Santa or maybe not a Santa and baby Jesus. And then you hand out the gift it's taken you a whole month to get them and the kids just eat through them in seven minutes straight and and then you say look what Santa got you but go help your mom and dad because they the ones who paid for this uh, because you want to teach them gratitude and and I've already seen some of you have built your, I'm tired already talking about this. You buy your gingerbread house and you've already done the house and the cookies and oh I love Christmas the only problem with Christmas, it goes by at the speed of light. You, you hardly start and it's all over. And I just want to make a public announcement. If by the end of January, you still have Instagram post with your Christmas tree in the back, you are making very bad decisions in life. I am just saying. But you see, Advent is a strange word for those who do not come from churches where that was a practice. The word Advent, as Jason said, is a very interesting word. It is a word that simply means in Latin, coming and waiting of something noble, something important. Now, we are already in the season where everything moves at the speed of sound. We are working harder. And, and for those who don't know, Rochester is a crazy place because we are getting ready for the winter. And while you get ready, it's not winter anymore. Now it's mud everywhere. And you've got to get ready for no mud to get ready for winter. And, and there is so much to do to get ready. And, and Advent can never be fully understood if we do not slow down. Because you see, Advent, it is the waiting and the slowing down and the anticipating that only a woman
carries that are carrying full term. Every day she wakes up and she knows any moment now, my life is about to change forever. Our love is going to change forever. There is an anticipation because Advent simply means for Israel that they were promised the king and God is going to send one, but they have to wait for the breaking in of that king. For we as followers of Jesus, we know that Jesus came and was born. So for us, it's a different kind of waiting. Advent for us is where we breathe deep, walk slow, and we set our hearts on the anticipation of God breaking into the shadow places of our lives. Because I don't know about you, but living life sometimes create callous and shadowy places in our lives where we need a miracle of new beginnings, of fresh reminders, the miracle of gratitude, because so much happens during the year. And I don't know about you, can you maybe just shout yes if you have places where you wish God could visit and fix things? Not only is it a waiting and an anticipating of our God that breaks into our heart places, but Scripture tells us that He's our soon and coming King. Now, you don't hear that preached often. Church where I came from, every Sunday night, they want to make sure that you don't die in your sleep Sunday night and go to hell. And they're telling you either you're dying or Jesus is coming tonight. Are you ready? But the longer we live, the more comfortable we get on earth. Scripture says, our Advent is not only waiting for Him to break in now, but we have a soon and coming King. Now I want to tell you a story about the candles on my left-hand side. The reason why I want to tell you about the candles is I pray that today you will be motivated by the story and the journey of Advent and you will go to Bed Bath & Beyond or Target. Don't be cheap and go to Five Below because those candles don't work. And then you're going to buy yourself four candles and you're going to light a candle every week on the start of Sunday. There is a gentleman, his name is um, um, Johann Heinrich Wickham. Johann Heinrich Wickham lived in around 1800, 1839. He was a Protestant pastor that uh, gave his heart to mission and at a mission school and over Christmas, the kids do what your kids do when they are small. They ask him every day, is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? So John was a smart man in 1839. He, he went outside and got the wheel of a wheelbarrow, and it was a wooden wheel, and he drilled 24 holes. And he put four big candles for the Sundays, and, and the wee candles were small candles, and it became known as the Advent wreath. We have a picture of the Advent wreath for you to see what it looks like. And so in many churches and in, on many tables, you find the Advent wreath, and every one of the big candles has a very specific name and a very specific purpose. So for us today in both of our campuses, we want to light the first candle. And there is a reason why there was a spider. It was his unlucky stinking day. <laughs> See ya, baby. <laughs> Being fried in church. That's how you go. There is another one. See you too. And see you. Dang, Ropo, what is in this thing? There's so many spiders. <laughs> Some of you are thankful to God. You are not preaching right now. I promise you, they babies. It's going to take two years to get to where you are. You're just fine. There's <laughs> so many spiders here. Yes. What is the Advent candle? What is the first week? Well, the first week is called the hope of the promise, the hope of the promise. Next week, I cannot begin to share with you after we exterminate the spiders, how the second and the third and the fourth place into it. But I want you to just breathe in this hope of the promise. Because you see, our God is a promise-making God. But He's a promise Declaring God, 
and he's a promise keeping God. Oh, this is huge. Because I have made many promises in my head that I never uttered. Those are safe promises. Because the moment you utter it, the worst thing is a dad, or the first lesson you learn really quickly in life, once you say it, you are trapped. Because your kids go, you promised. And you go like, it's not what I meant when I said it. They don't care. You promised. Because the moment your promise is spoken, now your integrity is at stake. Do you understand when God makes a promise, God speaks his promise, and now his integrity is at stake. That's why he says, I have exalted my word, my promise above my name. I guarantee my promise with my name. And because God is a promise-making God and a promise-keeping God, one thing that you will find out really quickly when you read the Bible or live long enough, that when God promises and when He fulfills His promise, sometimes takes a very long time. Come on, everybody that says, it would be really nice if God could speed up the time between the promise and the promise-keeping. Because you know when God promised Israel that He's going to send them a king that will rule and bring peace over the earth and reconcile all things? From the moment He made the promise, you know long, how long they had to wait for Bethlehem? 700 years. And for many of us, God made a promise over our lives. And for some of you, You've been waiting six weeks and you are angry. I'm going to say 700 years. Just because it's delayed doesn't mean it's denied. Oh, I would write that down. Just because God is taking his time doesn't mean he's changed his mind. Because God is a forever keeping God. But what he gives us while we wait for the promise, is this very obscure word called hope. Because you see, hope is what we hold on to while we wait for the promise. Now, hope is the very thing that gives us life and energizes us while we wait. That's why scripture says, a pregnant woman doesn't get diminished when she waits. She gets larger and larger and larger, and her joy is becoming more full and more full. But unfortunately, with most of us, me included, the longer I wait, the more despondent I get, and the more I want to reason with God why He is taking so long. Because Scripture says this in Proverbs 13, verse 12, and if you see that Scripture behind me, just shout, yes. Come on, I want you to know your neighbor needs to hear this. Come on, Greece Campus Online, let's read it together. It says, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. When hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. That's why you cannot let hope go, because when hope goes, your heart gets crushed. My brother, he lost his wife to breast cancer when she was 36. And after we buried her, I sat with him. And I says, this must have been the hardest for you. He says, no, this was not the hardest. He says, the hardest was the day that the doctor looked at us. And he says, there's nothing I can do. When hope died, she died. That's why the hope candle is so important. That's why we've got to light it and we've got to breathe slow. Because hope is what holds on to the promise that God has spoken over our lives. So I want to say this in a world that is filled with so much pain and disappointment. And, and things are fragmenting. And maybe around you the, the edges are fraying. What you thought is going to happen didn't happen. And you sit with the, the, the collision. And you sit with the, the pain of having to start again. And how do you bring hope to that? I can tell you how we bring hope to that. The biggest gift we can give ourselves is when we realize we do not have the answers to the questions. Oh, come on. Let me preach on that a little bit. Oh, I find it so entertaining when people want to argue with people about their problem. Listen, if we could fix it, it would not be there. People don't need answers because we can't, we can't fix things. We are not the doctor to people's disease. We are not even the superheroes that wear cape 
under our underwear, that we can go around and rescue the world from injustice. You know what an Advent people does? They bring light because they know who the hope is. And they the people that never feels hopeless. Because here's the question that God constantly asks, is anything too hard for God? Can I ask you today, is anything too hard for God in your life? Is there anything that's going on that God cannot rescue, that God cannot come into, that God cannot intervene? Is there any relationship too broken? Is there anything in your heart too weird and too sick? Is there any prison that you are privately in that our God cannot rescue you from? Because you see, Advent and the first week is the week of hope. That's why we can be an Advent people. Because we know hope can bring and break in against all odds. Now when Jesus came, and this is the important part of this stump. And I'm not going to go close to that stump again, by the way. I'm just slide from right here. I'm fine. This is the incredible thing about why it stands on a stump. Because you see, when Jesus came, he came against all odds. Do you know that every time God makes a promise, there is a promise destroyer that is out to get the promise cut off. Because you see, the enemy wants to humiliate our hope and distinguish our faith because if our hope goes, our faith goes, and our faith goes, we cannot receive anything from God. But as long as we hold on to hope, we are energizing our faith. And once we hold on to hope and energize our faith, no matter what it looks like, God is a promise keeper. And you see, all through Scripture, He tried to shut the promise down. I'm going to tell you that God has a promise over your life. And the enemy wants to destroy that promise and wants to prove to you that God doesn't care. And He's not truthful over His word. And Isaiah is such a potent book. And if ever there's a book to read during this Christmas season, it's the book of Isaiah because the world's in a mess. But then Isaiah says, I have a promise. I have a promise that God says, for unto us a child will be born. Unto us a son will be given. And the government's governance shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And he says, and of his increase and of his government, government of peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it. What he is saying is that through the bloodline of David, this king will come. Our Messiah, Jesus. This is so important. And he says, the zeal of the Lord will make this happen. I love that. You know what God says? I don't care what you think it's going to be. But at the end, I'm a passionate God that will make my promises come true. So we see that Jesse's bloodline, Jesse was David's father. In other words, if there's no Jesse, there can be no David. If Jesse's life gets messed up, then there is no David, and the bloodline through which the promise come will be interrupted. The Bible says that Jesse's life was cut down as a stump. We read, and I want you to read the scripture. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've memorized this. I'm, I'm just reading it for you right now. Isaiah 11 verse 1. Let me sit because I think I'm doing good sitting right now. Isaiah 11 verse 1. Come on, Greece campus. Come on online. Let's read it together. I know that this seems like an obscure scripture, but this is why you came. Trust me, this is why you came. It goes like this. There is a shoot that will come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its root will bear fruit. There is a shoot that will come from the stump of Jesse. What God is saying in Chapter 9, he is saying, there'll come a king. He says, but you don't know this. I know already how the promise destroyer is going to try and destroy this promise. So, even if you see a stump. Now, a stump is interesting because a stump is the representation of what used to be a tree. If the stump could talk. And we look at the stump and we go like, hey, by the way. How, 
how did you become this? If I look at this stump and I look all the, all the year rings on this, I can count really quickly. There's probably about 30, 40 year rings on this. And so, so there was a history that the stump could tell you. My life was great. And, and once upon a time, I was a lofty tree and I had beautiful branches and, and a fruitful time. And, and there were animals and birds. I, I, I was distinguished. I was beautiful, but something cataclysmic happened that cut me down to nothing. And I want you to know what is so tough about a stump. A stump is not a, a, a small, I, I wrote this down, a stump is not just a setback. A stump is cataclysmic humiliation. Because a stump is a reminder of what was and what will never be. A stump, death would be easier. If you uproot something and you throw it away, people who visit that ground will not know what used to be. But a stump will always tell you something great was, but it no longer is. Let me ask you a question. Do you have stumpy places in your life? Do you have places where if you've got to walk through your own heart? I walk through my own heart. I have big dreams and things that I'm trusting God for. But when I look, I see it's been cut down. It's been frustrated. Things that I'm dreaming for myself and my children. What about you? What about where you are? Where you look and you go like, oh God. You promised, but now all I see is a stump at my feet. But let me tell you this, that no matter what you are facing, you are not the first. Oh, come on, high five your neighbor, come on. Tell your baby, you're not the first. You're not the first. You are not the first. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is the, the enemy always wants to isolate us. He always wants to make us feel like we are the only victim that God is picking on. Um, you are, nobody has ever gone through this. Oh no, really, really, really. Um, I, I can tell you this all throughout scripture. Wherever there is a promise, there is an enemy with an ax that is going after you. And he's not there to kill you. He's there to humiliate you and steal your hope and steal your faith. So that forever you will stand in, in a frustrated relationship with a God. But you know what the Bible says about the stump? God says, even if you see a stump out of the stump, I will grow the shoot of my promise. A stump is not a sign of the end. A stump is a sign of a spectacular breaking in of God on the impossible of your life. Because God is a promise keeper over our lives in Jeremiah 29, 11, I love how the voice says this. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the eternal. Plans for peace, not evil, to give you in a future and a hope. Come on, shout, never forget it. Oh, no, come on. Everybody, Greece campus, everybody shout, never forget it. No, no, I want to feel you shout, never forget it. I want you to shout at your own heart. Never forget it. No matter what you see in front of you, in the eyes of man, it feels like it's over. But God says, my thoughts and my plans over you are for peace, for prosperity, for goodness. Never forget it. I'm a good, good father. That's who I am. When I look at your life, I don't see disaster. I see stumps with potential. Never forget it. That is why I can only tell you this. Do not uproot because when you uproot, root, there is no hope that remains while you stay in the ground, no matter how devastating it looks. Don't forget it. Our God grows promise shoots from cut off stumps that feels like humiliation. But what we see as humiliation is actually the table for exaltation that will always bring glory to God that when he restores you say 
you know I had nothing to do with this. Because I was a stump at my best effort. But then God. Man, I think if you ever want to get a tattoo, every week I suggest a new one. Uh, somebody emailed me and go like, do you have a tattoo parlor? Because you always say get one. I, I think, but then God is a good one to get. Because no matter what's going on, remember Job. Please say yes, please say yes. You remember Job. Some of you say, it's yes, like he's your great uncle. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Job. Job. In the Bible, whenever you're depressed, just go read about Job. Really. Pick up the message paraphrase. Job was the richest man. Job had sons and daughters, a wife, servants. Job had rich, influential friends. Job had everything you have. And Job walked with God. What else can a man need on that list? The Bible says in one day, Satan came with an axe, and in one report, his whole family was wiped out. Not only that, in one foul swoop, he lost everything he had. He became so sick that he sat on the town, literally trash heap, taking shards of pottery to scratch the boils and the wounds on his skin. One of the most prominent men became an outcast. His friends didn't even want him. His wife looked at him and said, even God has left you. You know what you should do, Job? Uproot. Curse God and die. That's what you should do. But you know what Job said in the book of Jer um, Psalms? No, Job chapter 14. I love this. I'm going to read this to you. And the musicians, both campuses can come. I love the scripture. Job, in the midst of everything that is broken, says, Though its root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. I love this. The New Living Translation says, Though its roots have grown old in the earth, and its stump decays. At the scent of water it may bout, bud and sprout again like new seedlings. What am I saying? I'm saying we as the Advent people live with a light of hope. And Foskamp wrote it this way. She says the mattering part in our lives is never what isn't. Let that sink in. What matters in your life is not what you've lost. It's not what is broken. It's not the anxiety and the, the turmoil in your life, the broken relationships. It's not the doctor's report. It's not that you may have lost your job like all the GM plants that have closed down, devastating to watch families. What is next? The mattering part is not what you think you have lost. The mattering part is not that your heart has been ripped out. The mattering part is not that everything that matters feel like it's been cut down to a stump of humiliation. The mattering part is that our God has the power to continue to grow the promise out what seems dead in our hands. Our God can grow living shoots from what feels like it's the end. What am I saying? I'm saying for some of you it feels like you've been pushed off a cliff and you're still falling. And I say this humbly because I want you to know as your pastor I have my fair share of struggle and agony just like you. I may smile every Sunday and sit here before you, and you go like, oh, he looks always happy. No, I'm not. Struggle in certain places. Dreams that have been cut down. Friendships that have been severed and lost. But in the midst of this all, no matter where you and I fall, and sometimes it feels it's free falling, 
do not be fearful because wherever the bottom is, it is solid and it carries the faithful arms of a God that will catch us. Because the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is a Savior and He flows an overflow in salvation. Don't you just love that? My kids don't have one inch of worry if there will be cereal in the morning. They are 23 and 20, and sometimes I go like, they should. They don't. They never worry. Because they've come to the conclusion, I'm a good dad. I want you to know that God is a good father. He's a good father over our stumps. He's a good father of our brokenness. And for me personally, I say, God, maybe my sense sometimes of humiliation is pride that you are waiting to die so that you can bring new beginnings, but not out of pride, out of a sense of hope that you are the promise keeper, that the end of our lives, if we hold on, is glorious. So today I want to say this, and I want to finish with these words. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what you are facing, there is hope. And my prayer is that you will not seek answers, but that you will light the candle of hope. Because you see, answers are cold. But the loving arms of God is warm. I love how one writer says, she says it this way, God didn't write the answers to our questions in the stars. God wrote the solution in his own scars when he died for you and I. The question is, can you trust him? God's looking you in the eye and me in the eye and say, hey, Pierre, can you burn the candle of hope every day? Because you trust me. You, not, you may not understand it. The pain may not go away. But slow down. Light the candle. And when you light the candle, walk through the garden of stumps and go like, marriage, you will live again. Children, you will love again. Crazy family will eat again. Kentucky Fried Chicken from Japan. They're at the same table. Job, it's not over. Life, you are not worthless. Addictions, the prison doors open and I'm coming out. I'm holding on to the hope of the breaking in of God on my life. Man, I love this message. I really do. So let me show you one last picture. I love this picture. When I look at that picture... It says it all. Don't give up. Weary soul, don't give up. Let me get as close as I can to this camera. You look at the screen. I cannot get close about this. Broken marriage, don't give up. Severed marriage. Don't give up. Our God specializes in new beginnings. Broken heart. Don't give up. Bitter disappointment. Don't give up. Betrayal. Don't give up. Hurt. Don't give up. Severed relationships. Don't give up. A toppled tree. Don't give up. No matter what you are facing, our God is a promise keeper. And He makes all things beautiful in His time. So this Christmas, would you go get a candle? Would you light it this week? The first thing you see in the day is the candle of hope. When people ask you why you're burning a candle, Go like, it's the candle of hope. Because you see, this is how you and I can be the light to wherever we are. 
is when we don't join the conversation of demise. But we wait for the breaking in of our king upon everything that is broken. Can I ask you to close your eyes as I pray for you today? Heavenly Father, the weight in this room so palatable because we as people with real lives experience some beautiful growing trees in our gardens yet we stumble and kick stumps of collisions cataclysmic disappointments but still your thoughts over us are good thoughts oh God I pray for every single person that are hearing my voice that hope will arise and we will light the candle of anticipation of the hope we have in Jesus and Him alone. Thank you that our Jesse tree reaches from heaven to earth and its branches are strong and it catches the falling. God, so I pray that those whose hands become weary, those whose hearts have become timid, those whose legs can no longer stand, strengthen them with your hope this Christmas season. For we await the breaking in of our King. Thank you that you're a promise keeper. Your thoughts over us are good thoughts, oh God. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouts. Amen. Hey, I want you to look at your name and say, go get a candle. Go get a candle. We're going to burn the candle of hope. Listen, before I hand the service, don't run out. I've got a very special video that was sent to us from Spain that I want you to see. Let me just lock in for one second before we receive the offering in our campuses. Our hope Christmas giving is in, starts in two week time. You say, what is our hope Christmas giving? For Christmas, we receive our gift towards helping people who feel lonely, lost, and despair and forgotten. Our Life Center has been handing out tons and tons of food. But I want you to know, this is very important for you to know, our desire and purpose not just to feed people's stomachs. Our purpose is to connect their hearts to Jesus and the restorative work of God in their lives for them to get hope, for them to get jobs, for them to break the cycle of poverty over their lives because our God reversed the curse of brokenness. That's what He does. But when we give into our hope Christmas offering, what we do is going to fund our life center for next year. It's all the food. It's all the outreach. It's the running cost. And our goal is $180,000 this year. You say, what, what do I need to do? I want to encourage you to simply ask the question with your spouse. And if you are single, just say, God, what do you want me to do? Because God always draws us, His people, to be part of the solution. Listen, and I want to remind you, sacrifice and giving goes together. The giving really is not about what you give. It's about the fact that you sacrificed in your giving. And I don't want you to feel manipulated. I don't want you to feel coaxed into anything. I want you to simply say, God, what do you want to do through my life? So that I am part of the advent of hope to our city and our community. And you can find information right here. And they've got a slide behind me of how this is going to work. And we start the 16th together. When we all do our part, I believe we're going to reach more people, expand further, reach deeper. Because we're the Advent people, the people of hope. So I'm going to give the service back to our Greece campus. Greece campus, we love you.